And I just would like to welcome everybody to the International Elephant Foundation's Conservation Chat. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Julie Bates, and I'm the Donor Relations Manager. And as we go through the presentation this morning, just a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, we have people who are on the line from all over the world, and so we want to make sure we can maintain as much bandwidth as possible for our presenter. And so um, if you, when we get started here, we're gonna ask you everybody to keep their cameras turned off and, and also mute yourself. Um, and as we're going through the presentation, if you have questions, just please put them in the chat and then we will get to those. And then if we have some time at the end, we may open it up to some uh, live questions. We'll just see how the, uh, how the presentation progresses and how many questions we have. And other than that, um, I'm looking forward to a great presentation. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah, but before I do, I also wanna introduce our executive director, Deborah Olson, who's on the line with us this morning as well. So um, Sarah and, and Deborah and I, um, you're looking at our IEF team. So um, I'm gonna turn it over now to Sarah and she's gonna tell you a little bit more about our presenter. Good morning, everyone, or good evening. If you're in other parts of the world, we are really lucky today. We have an excellent speaker for you. We have Dr. Avinash Krishnan, who is a wildlife biologist working toward the conservation of endangered wildlife species and important bio biodiversity regions in India. He is a director for AROCA India, supervising a project trialing an early warning system um, and the surrounding areas in order to reduce the chances of elephant vehicle collisions. As you know, um, a lot of places that elephants live are not like our regions. So we are gonna learn about the challenges that face communities around the world, namely in India. And we are very lucky to have Dr. Krishnan here today to share his wisdom. So please give him your wonderful attention and put your questions in the chat. Welcome, Dr. Krishnan. Thanks, Sarah. <clears throat> Let me quickly try and share my screen. Can you see it? Perfect. We can see it. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. At the outset, let me let me thank um, yourself and Deborah for firstly giving me the opportunity to present this work as part of your conservation chat series. And I'm also very privileged to share that this project was also funded by the IEF. And it's 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 a great opportunity for us to kind of showcase what we've done with this support and also try and highlight this important issue that we're trying to tackle in, in, in our focal region in India. So like you said, my talk is about installing an early warning signal for elephant crossing roads in India, as you're aware. We're one of the most populous countries and inevitably we have a lot of linear transport infrastructure which which in a developing nation is a prerequisite for building economy and so on and so forth so but interestingly we also have an array of wildlife especially elephants that inhabit several parts of this country and one such issue that we've been facing, which also directly influences the, the conservation of elephants, especially the Asian elephants, is the issue of uh, elephant vehicle collisions. Um, so to quickly get into my talk, I asked that fundamental question, just replace the chicken with the elephant. Why do the elephants cross the road? And, and that's how I like to keep this narrative and explore different nuances as to how uh, our intervention would try to mitigate uh, the issue of uh, elephant vehicle collisions and also try and indicate how this would help the conservation of the species on the long term. So why do the elephants cross the road? Uh, because of this. Um, in a country like India, we have about, India is part of the 13 range countries where Asian elephants are found. And if you look at South and Southeast Asia, we have about 85% of the human population, which harbors about 77% of the wild Asian elephant population. So if you look at India particularly, we have about 29,000 Asian elephants that are divided into five metapopulations. So it's probably the highest density of 
wild Asian elephants that you would find anywhere in the world. And when it comes to the challenges of elephant conservation, we realize, rather we recognize today that human elephant conflict is the foremost threat for the conservation of the species. And having said that, we also have encounters between elephants and people because you have high elephant densities and high human density. So invariably, the issue of human elephant conflict is it, is it at its peak. So if you look at the IUCN, SSC, we've come up with a figure of saying that there are about one elephant, for every one elephant, two people die because of the, the enormous densities in which elephants and humans live. And if you look at um, the recent report that was released by the IUCN Association Elephant Specialist Group, the Linear Transfer Infrastructure Report, it clearly identifies eight types of anthropogenic influences on the species and ecosystems because of pretty much any linear infrastructure. So for us, we're focusing on road networks, but in India, the most common linear infrastructure is roadways, highway, highways, roadways, networks, and also uh, railway tracks, uh, electrical lines, and so on and so forth. So if you, uh, if you look at the implication it has, on the ecosystem where elephants live for about one kilometer of road network in a national park in India, <clears throat> habitat and habitat loss and degradation affects about roughly 10 hectares of habitat. So this was a study that was done uh, in 2011. So keeping this as the backdrop, you invariably realize that elephants and people, especially in India, have to interact on almost a daily basis on various capacities, and sometimes these interactions turn negative and hostile, resulting in losses on both sides. So quickly to jump into the area that we've been working, our focus has been the Banargata Hosu landscape. In, in this particular study or this particular project, we've only looked at the Banargata National Park, which is about a 260 square kilometer habitat. It forms the terminal point of the Mysore Elephant Reserve in the state of Karnataka. Karnataka, for your information, the state of Karnataka is 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 the is the state that has the highest elephant population in India. Roughly about eight thousand odd elephants live in this state, and this state um, and this park particularly is connected to the Mysore Elephant Reserve, which has the highest densities of elephants. And if you look at the biogeography, uh, the Banagata National Park sits at the terminal point of the Eastern Ghats in the state of Karnataka. So if you can see the map, we have the Western Ghat, Eastern Ghat complex, which we also call as the Brahmagiri Niligiri Eastern Ghat landscape, which, which is a chain of protected areas that is linked between three states. Um, so the park that we're actually focusing today is a very linear, um, fragmented habitat for elephants. We have roughly 300 odd elephants that kind of use this protected area throughout the year. Although this protected area is connected to other adjoining elephant habitats towards the Southeast and Southwest. Now these 300 elephants is quite a large number for a park of this size. Uh, it almost represents the population size of elephants in the, state, in the country of Bangladesh. And what is more interesting as well as challenging is the, is the fact that this park is south of India's third populous city, Bangalore. Um, it is one of the many metros that we have. It has a population of about 12 million people and roughly 1 million people just live around this protected area. Now, in terms of the conflict metrics, the Bangalore Circle, which is the administrative terminology used in the state of Karnataka, especially by the Forestry Department, uh, the Banagata National Park is part of this Bangalore Circle out of the 32 forest divisions that is present in Karnataka that has elephants. We unfortunately report the highest instances of HEC, which is about 60% of, of the HEC cases uh, recorded in this park in the year 2022. The map below identifies about 69.4 kilometers of road networks. These are public thoroughfares that crisscrosses the park at all levels. We don't have any restrictions uh, for commuters, nor is these roads manned. Uh, so these roads pass through all prime habitats where elephants frequently move. So somewhere roads and elephants are pretty much part of the ecosystem and, and humans have to access their, access their daily needs, uh, get, to, get to the big cities to work. So invariably they encounter elephants, like I said earlier, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so articles like this in the local dailies is is very common. We we have encounters of uh, elephants and people, and and like I said earlier, the, these encounters invariably lead into accidents and collisions. So so keeping this in the backdrop, 
as an organization, as a team, we decided to look at this and, and see if we can come up with interventions to mitigate very specifically this negative elephant vehicle encounter that happens on these roads that crisscross the national park or the protected area. So we decided to look at something that is tech based because of the enormous scale of the landscape and also the nitty gritties of how elephants use this. So, and also in, in this particular park technology hasn't been explored to the fullest potential compared to other protected areas in the country as well as the state. So we decided to develop something that's obviously novel, uh, but also focus on a five pillar approach, which probably would be more sensible in a landscape like this, which has recurring issues with respect to human elephant conflict. So the first pillar was to look at a smart tool to early warn and, and look at automated detection, something that can be uh, triggered or something that can be very effective in kind of identifying elephant movements and also alert commuters who are using this place so that we can reduce it reduce the chance of these collisions or accidents. We wanted something to be very simple so that it can easily you know, imprint on, on computers so that they can relate to a normal traffic signal because when elephants move, people move, there has to be some kind of regulation in these, in these roads that move through the forest. So we wanted something that can you know, mimic a normal traffic signal. Uh, we also wanted a tech that could you know, synchronize with commuter and elephant movement so that there is coordination between both movements of where elephants are actually using certain parts of the road, as well as where people are actually applying on these roads as well. Uh, with tech, we all we recognize that there are challenges because tech is not a very advanced proposition, at least in, in this uh, part of India. We haven't been seeing very effective mechanisms uh, to uh, kind of um, understand uh, how tech can actually be effective. So therefore we wanted to, to do something that can reduce false positive because that is something that we also recognize is, is a big concern with uh, detecting uh, using technology. And, and obviously uh, last but not, definitely not the least, we wanted something that can be low cost and scalable across different protected areas and even the adjoining protected areas where the issues or the challenges are very similar. Uh, we kept about uh, four aspects in mind when we started off this deployment, and some of them we also recognized as we were deploying these devices. We obviously kept in mind the traffic intensity because some of these roads uh, are linking major towns and cities. Dr. Krishnan, I believe you are muted. Hi guys, we are experiencing some technical difficulties. We will get Dr. Okay. Hello, sorry, sorry, oh. sorry, sorry about that. Did That's okay, you're back. Okay, cool, 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 sorry. Thank you. Yeah, so the first thing, like I was saying, is the, the traffic intensity because some, like I was mentioning, some of these roads connect major towns, major cities. So obviously in certain roads, the traffic's were, traffic intensity was very high. For example, one of the roads recorded about 20 vehicles per minute. And like I mentioned that these roads are unregulated. So there's no legal uh, imposition on, on, on speed, as well as uh, number of vehicles allowed on these roads. Secondly, uh, Banagata, if you look, if you remember looking at the map, it's a highly fragmented landscape. And, uh, and in terms of uh, land use, land cover, it's, it's human dominated. So we don't have vast expanse of forests. So therefore, uh, when elephants have to move between habitats, we have to look at connectivity between them. So we ensured that these these devices, or especially the detection devices, were located in areas where elephants are actually moving or or using those points, those those crossing points, as a connectivity between habitats. So therefore, we kept a two hundred meter principle on either side of the road, considering that these would be connecting habitats. Um, since the landscape is vast, it spreads across states. Uh, we still have issues with power and network in terms of GSM networks, as well as power sources to you know, run these devices. So we kind of kept uh, power and network in mind and identified areas that are conducive with power as well as networks so that the efficiency of the devices are not compromised. Uh, we also kept uh, in mind the human and elephant interference factor so that we devised, uh, you know, designed our devices ensuring that there would be zero 
uh, uh, threats to the devices themselves from elephant or people, such as theft, alteration, and breakages by elephants, in order to not to compromise the, the de detection of the devices and also to ensure that the relay of information is crucial. But we also wanted to ensure that the devices can last for longer times because it's important that these, these things work and also uh, inform or rather do their jobs of you know, informing commuters about when elephants are actually crossing or about to cross. So the design build is actually very simple. It, it We call it the smart fence. It kind of mimics something like a burglar alarm. So just, just for others to understand, so this is, uh, a graphic representative. So this is one side, the greens are the forests, and then you have the farms and the settlements. So you have a road passing through it. And these roads at the at the beginning of the forest, you have these check posts where you have forest guards who kind of manage the entry and exit, although they don't regulate traffic, but but there are station outposts that they they're they're stationed and and they kind of keep keep an eye on elephants when they cross. But they don't do anything, but they just keep a monitoring mechanism in place. Uh, so the device that we're actually talking about now is, is very simple. It, it has a transmitter and a receiver. A transmitter is, is a device that sends out an infrared beam, which is captured by the receiver, and that forms a kind of a virtual fence. And the transmitter is attached with a module, and, and we've identified several locations within this forest habitat or within where the roads pass through the forest habitat and have multiple units of this. So a, a unit is defined as a transmitter and a receiver. And this device gets switched on automatically based on daylight settings. So typically in our landscape, we have elephants crossing this road, particularly in the night. And these devices switch on at around six in the evening. They emit an infrared beam at a particular height, at a particular distance. All of them have been custom made based on how elephants move and use this area. And, and these roads, like I said, is, is constantly, has constant traffic. So what, what exactly happens is when an elephant passes through these, these locations, uh, basically cutting the beam, we have an SMS that goes on to these outposts where the, where the local beat watcher or the beat forester is, is around and he gets an SMS indicating the location and the movement time. And once that happens, uh, you have the signals, the elephant signals, which basically mimic the traffic signal that is installed at the beginning at the end of the road, they start illuminating. As of now, we've just kept it at that level. There are several payloads that can be added onto this. We can create a hooter system. But as of now, we've just kept these early warning signals or the signal boards at the beginning of the end of the road beginning to blink. And once they start blinking, the commuter is aware of elephant presence up ahead. Some of them are placed at certain distances. So we're also trying to make a quick fix of uh, of adding a ticker board, which will tell you at the beginning of the road, when you enter the protected area, that an elephant is expected to be is expected to be detected at, at a certain distance from the start uh, of the road. So this, this applies on either sides of the road. Uh, just to quickly give you a run through on the specifications, these are all indigenously made with our partner, who's basically a, 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 an IT solution person from a university. So they and 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 the Arosha team have been able to indigenously um, design the transmitter receiver module and also the signal board. So that's the signal board actually blinking in the night when a detection was recorded, or rather an alert was issued to it from the break of the, uh, the beam. And uh, these are constantly being developed um, and also modified based on the requirements as we continue with the deployment and, and the maintenance in the field. Uh, but we've been able to establish a full functional system, which is actually working. So we're very happy with the, the, the project that the, these devices have been able to do the expected work that we wanted it to do. Um, just to quickly give you a run through of how the the setup uh, began, uh, it's it started off by setting up the poles, uh, installing the transmitter and the receivers at critical crossing points along these roads. The modules have been placed. Uh, this is how the transmitter looks like when it when it you know, 
throws out the beam, the infrared beam from a certain distance. Right now, we've been able to test its efficacy at optimum at around 200 meters. So the, the transmitter receiver can work at a distance of about 200 meters. And this is how it looks in the night, uh, which is pretty much when it's actually operational. And um, so these are in, in the image, uh, in the earlier image, these, these transmitter receiver units are placed just beside the roads at critical crossing points. And once, once the beam is cut, pretty much when an elephant crosses, you have these boards beginning to blink. And these SMS bursts are sent out to the concerned uh, forestry people, uh, the local forestry people, as well as researchers from our team, so that they're aware of where the detection actually happened, the location, the time, and so on and so forth. Um, as part of the project, we've identified about 22 roads. Um, um, uh, 16 roads, uh, and we've deployed 32 devices, or rather 32 units, out of which 22 units have been showing optimum functionality. 10 have been having issues, which been, we've been trying to refine it, you know, various reasons, network issues, and so on and so forth. But we believe that in the months to come, we'll be able to refine this and have all 32 locations working optimally. And on the right, when you see the map, you can see how the roads are actually cutting through the forest at different junctures. Uh, we believe in holistic approaches, and and even in this project, we realized that apart from just being an early warning signal or an early warning device, it has three major components, the research component, the training component, as well as the education component. The research component is essentially data collection because we realized that there has been a lack of data or studies done on the efficacy of early warning systems and how they're actually able to influence the cause in which we're trying to address, in this case, mitigating elephant-human collisions. Uh, so our teams uh, have been able to daily record um, uh, the detections as well as cross-verifying them in the field and ensuring that repair and maintenance is at optimal level so that we don't have any limitations from the device or, or for that matter, have any false positive detections. Uh, we have been training the forest department. We've done almost three trainings so far in trying to make them understand the implications of this because this kind of really helps them to uh, you know reduce their efforts or rather reduce their kind of uh, efficiency uh, which otherwise is is absent uh, so therefore these trainings are very important for them to understand the implications of such devices and how they can benefit from it because ultimately the the end user in this case is the forest department we've also been sensitizing commuters uh, from the education bit as to how these devices would actually help them in, in order to reduce uh, collisions or accidents. Uh, we also plan to involve local schools, volunteers, so on and so forth, to make this a holistic sensitization effort so that uh, this device actually helps them uh, from, from the issue that we're trying to address, which is mitigation of uh, human elephant conflict in the, in the broader sense. Uh, and we we propose to do these activities on a regular basis at different time intervals based on contexts and situations across the year. And we want this to be an adopted model uh, for protected areas that have roads cutting through them. So I believe that this holistic approach is going to probably be a baseline for how um, early warning systems can actually pan out for conservation purposes. Uh, we've done some preliminary assessments in the last 26 days across four major roads that have had maximum detections uh, so far, uh, because as you all must be aware, elephants don't uniformly use the landscape throughout the year. So right now in India, this is our fag end of summer, and we've been able to record uh, reportings or rather alerts of elephants in particular roads uh, based on the number of units, based on the traffic intensity and other variables that we've enlisted. Uh, we've been able to achieve a golden hour period, which is essentially between 9 p.m. in the night and about 3 to 4 in the morning. And this is when we actually notice the movements of elephants. Now, this is very particular to this season, and we're assuming that this can change across different seasons uh, uh, in the landscape. But what this gave us insight was to try and refine our detection for this eight hour period, which is quite critical for us in some sense, uh, to ensure that uh, there are uh, no collisions, zero collisions for that matter. 
Um, we also did some analysis in particular roads, and we realized that certain roads have the highest elephant detection and also the highest number of traffic. Uh, so we've extrapolated this with the mean number of elephants of the park that was done by the government in terms of population. Um, and we've also assumed that each detection would be done by a minimum of one elephant. And we realized that the Statikare road, which also happens to be a state highway, which connects two large towns currently, but also connects other states, adjoining states, has the highest number of detections and number of elephants actually moving in this area per hour, about roughly about 11 odd elephants kind of use this. And similarly, we've seen low number of uh, 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 detections in other roads, which probably link only one settlement, but we also have another area which has highest detection with lowest uh, time observation, which means that, the, for example, the Jaipur Rodi Road, which is also part of the elephant corridor, has about seven elephants detected in a low observation time, which which indicates that this road is crucial because it, you know, kind of connects an elephant, passes through an elephant corridor. So some basic assessment so far, but once we have uh, a stable and uniform data sets across the entire, we should be able to come up with more inferences uh, further ahead. Uh, we've had uh, great feedback and support from our partners, the Forest Department, uh, the Karnataka Forest Department. We've got into a collaboration with them uh, in terms of this project, and they've been extremely positive and supportive. We've had uh, officers of the highest rank, uh, the head of the states, who've kind of visited this project and understood its implication, given their feedback on how this can actually be scaled and some of the technological inputs they had. So we're very fortunate to have the support provided by them. Uh, this is one of our rangers explaining how the device actually works at night after a detection was recorded. I don't think we can hear his audio. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I thought. Oh, sorry. So he was basically explaining uh, the the device as to how it works, and, and uh, he's very happy that this collaboration has been able to come up with this uh, with this uh, project, as well as being able to have these uh, devices installed. So that's pretty much what he had to say. Sorry about that. Um, so coming to towards the end. Um, uh, as, like I said earlier, this device or this technology or this attempt, for that matter, has been uh, a novel initiative in this landscape. So there's obviously a lot more scope and refinement considering the context in which this has been um, uh, constituted. Um, there are five, about four uh, takeaway aspects that we're very hopeful about. One is that uh, these early warning signals have highlighted the need of a proactive approach towards the mitigation of road collisions in the state of Karnataka. Until now, we do not have anything similar to this in, in the state as well as this landscape. So we see this as a growing opportunity to test devices across different landscapes, elephant landscape, as well as try and modify it based on requirement for different wildlife species. Uh, we'd like to, like I said, uh, the device gives us an opportunity to develop or add more payloads to it. So we'd like to improve the detection uh, and move more advanced from infrared detection to something in the likes of Seismic or AI and things like that. So therefore, additional detection tools could be incorporated to refine trigger responses uh, that are more accurate and more precise. Although these devices are working very optimally as of now, but we believe that technology has to be upgraded. Therefore, this, this early warning system gives us that opportunity to do it. Uh, since these are GSM-based modules, and uh, and like I said, the remoteness of the landscape in certain locations not entirely have issues with connectivity and also direct power sources. So we are also trying to improvise on that so that we have optimal results uh, across areas where uh, there are low uh, connectivity issues and low uh, current issues. So um, we, as part of this project, we we plan to 
uh, monitor this for a period of a year to kind of refine the technology as well as improve the detection and see what it has to offer in terms of mitigating road collision and so on and so forth. And also to try and be able to establish this as a base, baseline tech tool uh, for monitoring road networks that pass through protected areas. And we also like to add an additional year uh, before we hand over the entire <clears throat> Uh, system to the forest department, which can be used by them as part of their regular wildlife management protocols, and also be able to advance the, the pioneering application of uh, technology in HEC resolution in this landscape. Uh, in terms of conservation value, I feel that, I mean, this is the most important bit, at least personally, that in one of the roads, there is a proposal of broadening it and putting a flyover. And there's been a lot of debate and discussion uh, about it. And currently it is parked with the forest clearance department. And one of the roads are currently being monitored. And I'm hoping that through the data that we'll be able to gather on elephant moment, we could possibly avert this proposal, which, which we believe will have detrimental impacts on elephants as well as this ecosystem. So till now, there wasn't any data on, on or probably systematic data on elephant movement. So through this early warning system, monitoring exercise, we should be able to arrive at that. And I'm sure that through the courts or for that matter, being able to provide to the government the implications of elephants moving and any change into that ecosystem or habitat would have disastrous effects on elephants. Uh, so I'm assuming that this, this study will be able to provide that valuable input. Um, <clears throat> uh, in protected areas in India have something known as the management plan, and that's like the Bible of how forests are actually managed. Uh, and we believe that through this study, we should be able to push this as a policy document where the, the early warning system using uh, traffic signals, early warning signals to mitigate road collisions could be uh, empaneled onto the management plan so that the forest department could use this as a policy to kind of install or manifest this technology across all protected areas and also in Banagata National Park, which is where we are working. So we believe that a project like this would also influence policy and governance, especially when it comes to this protected area. And as we are also closer to, to Bangalore, the IT, IT capital of India, we also believe that there could be a lot more partnerships and collaborations that can be established now that we have this project live, it's, it's, it's on ground and it's working. We're hoping that this project, once it's been able to look at what it can offer from, from the elephant conservation angle and also create scope for technology uh, ahead, we believe that this would be able to harness or garner a lot more uh, cooperation and partnerships from IT uh, partners and other uh, knowledge partners that can help uh, you know complement the efforts that we're actually doing. So I think I've probably got done well within time and and i kept it simple and i'll be hopeful that if there are any questions to answer and i really thank everyone who's been able to give me this opportunity and also i'm very hopeful about this project uh in the years to come and and the kind of implications it has for elephant conservation in general thank you very much thank you that was excellent um and we're getting lots of positive feedback in the chat so i know that people are really uh, enthusiastic about your work, which is great. Um, first, can you say how many of these are currently deployed and how many are planned? So all, um, as per this project, Sarah, all 32 have been deployed. 22 are actually working at full potential. 10 have been not very consistent in terms of their detection. So we're just being able to refine, but all 32, um, uh, units across 16 road networks have been currently deployed. Wonderful. And then people were asking, does this system work during the day if needed? I know you said it works by infrared, but is that only a nighttime thing or can it work in the daylight? Well, it could work technically in, 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 in the day as well, but we do not have any crossings during that time. Um, so we've programmed the modules to only detect between 6 a.m., 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. in the morning as of now, but we've also been able to record a golden hour period where we see maximum number of movement uh, otherwise as well. So we wanted it to be very custom made and synchronized with the elephant movement. Otherwise, we're just using it when it's technically not required. And elephants don't generally cross roads during the day, at least in, in, in our area that frequently. 
makes perfect sense. Uh, people in Western countries are really aware of uh, overpasses and tunnels for wildlife. Sort of, uh, I know here in California, they are building an overpass over one of the freeways for some California big cats. But can you say why maybe that approach doesn't work in your region um, or if that was a consideration? I think with elephants, we've not been able to achieve that systematically, although we have examples of, of uh, overpasses and underpasses for tigers, and they claim to say that it kind of works for them. But for an animal which has defined home ranges um, and have moments very annually and seasonally, I, I wouldn't be able to uh, honestly give a very sound opinion about how they would use very small links between habitats. What we can do is we can minimize the threats that they have in these links, which is what this project is essentially trying to do. But if if going forward, uh, at least in certain areas, we do not have that problem of creating overpasses and underpasses. Even for that matter, the one that, that is being proposed right now is totally unnecessary in this region. Um, I wouldn't recommend something like that unless we have a comprehensive understanding of how elephants actually use a particular area and a particular time of the year and unless we know that uh, just by linking small special structures between habitats I'm not really sure but in many cases we've noticed that where people have done that elephants don't actually use it so in terms of data we don't have consistent information as to how these are actually used at least by elephants that makes perfect sense uh, you definitely need something that will actually address the problem as opposed to just a, a good visual right uh, so other, another question from the chat, do elephants leave the park and are there similar road problems in sort of public and private lands outside of this area? Yeah, of course. I mean, human elephant conflict is the larger issue that we're actually trying to mitigate as part of the work that we've been doing here since the last 20 years. Um, so, and we have other initiatives to kind of mitigate the crop depredation bit, which which technically is where the elephants leave the forest and go into human use areas. Uh, so that involves a very different approach. It involves a very different narrative in terms of what we're trying to mitigate. But here specifically, um, we're trying to look at elephant and vehicle road collisions. So I think for this, we believe that this would be the specific solution. But we do have roads that actually pass through private places as well. But those private places are generally managed by the government. Uh, road is generally uh, laid out on government land, but there are also private roads in private estates and private land ownerships. Elephants do use those roads as well, but there we do not have the problem of collisions. But if, if there is a case of a collision, we would call that a conflict incidence because elephants are pretty much there to raid crops and and those accidental encounters have to be dealt differently because needs are different. Here, it's a very specific issue of uh, road collision, which also prevents road kills and so on and so forth. Absolutely. And that makes perfect sense. You have to tailor the approach to the actual circumstance and the need. Um, can you tell us more about the outreach you did with the Forest Department staff uh, and sort of how you integrated them into this approach and sort of maybe the baseline information that they came in with versus uh, what you had to do to train them on this program? Well, this, this is one of the many programs that we like to do because in a landscape like ours, we have four different administrative units, about 350 forest personnel on ground. Uh, the, the one program that we did involving about 100 odd people was essentially to acquaint them to the technology because this is very new to them, rather very nuanced. And there were mixed opinions about it in terms of how it would work. And most of it, most most of the information that we shared with them was welcomed very positively because it kind of reduces a lot of day-to-day -day monitoring, especially in cases where an accident happens or perhaps it's you know has already happened and and there's a lot of stress on the department because once an accident happens, there's a lot of reaction. It's a very reactive intervention. So they were very happy with the, the proactive approach where before a problem like this happens, there's already systems in place. 
and monitoring is more efficient when information is already provided to them before they actually kind of have to address the problem. So these training programs are essentially on lines of that. It is to primarily tell them how the technology works and most importantly, involve them as part of the technology because they're the ones who would ultimately benefit from it. So when I say benefit from it, they should also participate in the regular maintenance, uh, join teams in terms of data collection, and also keep vigil when they get these information. They also have a rapid response team that also apply during the night on these roads to mitigate human elephant conflict uh, in villages that are surrounding this these areas. So once they get these messages, they immediately go visit these spots because otherwise they wouldn't have any clue of where elephants are actually moving because none of these are monitored at a fine scale. There's no other monitoring mechanics in terms of elephant movement between habitats or between you know ranges. So these training programs are largely aimed at that to kind of build capacity in them and also make it a very cooperative strategy between researchers and forest departments so that there's uh, full support and scale when it comes to the implementation. That's very important. Uh, at IEF always make sure that in projects that we support, there's some sort of uh, community buy-in because we know how important that is for sustainability. Um, Dovetailing with that, someone's asking, how does the public feel about elephants in general and elephants on the road? Are they cautious drivers? Are they sad for the animal if it gets hit or angry when it damages their vehicle? Things like that. What's the sort of general public consensus on that? Well, I think in a country like India, if you have 29,000 elephants, it clearly indicates that people are generally tolerant of elephants. And I'd still like to believe because that's the hope for conservation, at least for me. Uh, but but people's opinions change based on their socioeconomic status. And that's the case in, in most of the range countries where elephants are actually found. So in Banargata specifically, it's slightly mixed because if you look at the socioeconomic gradient of communities, it's it's very different. It varies. Uh, if you look at the north of the park, very close to cities, they have a different mindset. Right? As you go further south, when the socioeconomic gradient comes a little lower in terms of the demographics, their perceptions are different. But when it comes to elephants on the roads, there's obviously a sense of unawareness because many cases uh, we've had collisions because, because people didn't know where elephants were or where they were crossing. So that sense of anxiety is, is obviously there when you're especially moving in the night. And not because they have to move in the night because of other reasons, but they have to do it because of their daily routine. Some have to come back from work. Some have to go to get go to the local grocery shop. So they, there's obviously a sense of fear and anxiety when they pass these roads. They're aware of elephants in that area. But now that a device like this is beginning to take shape, we believe that through the, the commuter surveys that we've done in the past, we, we recognize the importance of this. And now they're at least more relieved. They realize that there is some kind of detection. It's simple, like it's as simple as a traffic signal. So I can imagine, so if you can imagine a city without traffic signals, what would be the kind of situation? So so right now, prior to this, the situation was like that in these forests, or probably these roads that cut through these forests. But after this, we we are hopeful that that the commuters would be able to be, be able to ply with or with more security and safety and uh, and also they'd be informed if elephants are actually there and and including the forest department so they also would be more active especially in times in, in which they were not earlier aware um, so that way i think uh, there is a lot of positive feedback especially with respect to this application to mitigate uh, road collisions and accidents but when it comes to the regular HEC, just going a step further, the regular HEC narrative, their sentiments are much different because that aspect kind of affects their livelihoods. And then generally, uh, there is a very negative uh, perception. Again, very similar to other elephant range areas. Uh, but this project has been very positively received by the beneficiaries, especially the commuters, both local commuters, as well as the people who use these roads from different cities and towns. That's great to hear. That's very good. Um, so what are your greatest needs for this project to make it successful and sustainable uh, and improve any successes thus far? Well, I'd like to see this not as a project. I mean, it started as a project for a particular time based on the support that we got, but I'd like this to be something that is implanted into the regular management of the park. And that's how I think as an organization, we'd like to think about elephants in this landscape. 
for a species that lives as long as us, I think we need to look at something on the long term and not just look at it as short time intervals. So with respect to this project, we'd obviously like to improvise on the tech. Now that we have a footing, we've realized that this tech is actually helpful, but we know with, with technology, everything can get redundant over a period of time. Or for that matter, when it comes to elephants being so intelligent, they can probably overcome it. I'm just assuming um, in, in this case. So I think for us, we would look at future upgrades in terms of detection modules. And I'm glad that this, this, this project gives us this opportunity to make it more refined and probably use the same application to try and you know address other issues. Because this is probably the pioneering effort of using technology to actually look at elephant detection. And detection is a problem with conflict in any place because we are not able to proactively address conflict because we we very poorly uh, do the detections and it's not to blame anything but but this is how it is in a forest ecosystem where elephants at large numbers use and people are there so we try to use certain learnings of certain uh, excerpts from this in applying this kind of technology for other human elephant conflict related mitigation aspects uh, but with, with something particular to this, we'd like to scale this up to the adjoining landscape of North Kaveri Wildlife Sanctuary, which is just another, which is which is just like a hop, skip and jump for the elephant. We are only focusing on this 260 square kilometer area, but just southeast of it, we have another 400 odd square kilometer area with about 500 odd elephants. Um, and those landscapes also need, just, just today, some of my colleagues at Conan had a conversation with the forest officers from the adjoining park and they were very happy about this exercise coming coming up and they were also showing some interest so for us the logical expansion would be to try and establish it in the adjoining protected area because the same elephants use you know uh, both landscapes that makes perfect sense yeah that would be great so in terms of expanding um what are the challenges for that is the limitation uh, money, resources, staff? I think it's just the resources to be very specific because we have everything in place. We have a dedicated team. We have dedicated support from some of our partners. We've been able to have the needed stakeholders with us. So for us, it's just about having more resources to pretty much buy more units to be able to establish it in the other protected areas, at least the adjoining protected area to start with and then have a consistent long-term monitoring plan for it. And I mean, keeping it humble and simple in, in, in that sense is, is, is critical for projects like this. Absolutely. Um, someone's also asking if this technology, because over here, people have read stories about elephants getting hit by trains in India. Do you think that your technology or system might aid with that or be adapted to help with that problem? Yes, in fact, that was one of the most important feedback that we got in our field visits from the forest officers because they were also uh, the issue of rail hits. Um, in, uh, thankfully, we do not have that problem in the state of Karnataka. We haven't had a case of elephants being hit by trains, but we've had a suite of other wildlife being hit by hit by trains, especially the Indian God and so on and so forth. I see a very logical expansion of this technology in that area. Uh, because with, with rail with rail tracks, what I understand is there's a lot of management measures in place, uh, which also needs to be supplemented with this technology because you cannot have a technology that is just detecting, you know, you know, elephants crossing or wildlife crossing. But if you cannot reduce the speed of the vehicle, because here in this technology, the signal itself is an indication that you obviously have to reduce your speed. And that's what all these sensitization programs are supplemented with. Uh, so with railways, we have some limitations like that, but I'm sure that as per the technology, it can clearly work in, in, in road rail networks in critical crossing points, just like this. But I also feel that when it comes to that specific requirement, there has to be some other management level supplementation in terms of reducing, you know, the speed of trains, clearing off visible areas and so on and so forth. If all of that can be done, I think this would also very clearly fit into that narrative easily. That's wonderful and gives a good amount of hope. So people are asking, what can they do to support? What can IEF do more to support this kind of work, expand it and ensure and build on the successes you've had thus far? No, I mean, I'll be very honest, uh, Shara, if IEF didn't support this, this wouldn't have happened in the first place and I wouldn't be sitting here and speaking to all these people. So that way we're very, very thankful for the support 
to be able to recognize the work of ours and also be able to support it to bring it to this day. So we're extremely grateful, not just me as a team. We're very thankful that this has actually come to a landscape which is not clearly looked at in mainstream elephant conservation, at least the 200 odd elephants that we have were not even considered in the larger conservation map. But having said that, uh, there is a lot more scope uh, considering that we've had a very positive collaboration with the forest department, especially on this project. We see a lot more expansion and a lot more use more, more so. Uh, I don't want to sound like we just like to expand, but we see that this technology, once it's refined and you know made it, made, and it makes to the policy, which is something that I'd like to see. Uh, uh, where, you know, when you have issues like this or similar landscapes have problems like this with elephants and people, like, especially when it comes to road networks, these kind of immediately available tools can be uh, accessed. And we're also trying to see if we can make this a little more low cost uh, in terms of uh, testing. So uh, so we'd like to put a little more money in the R&D to try and, because right now we've just worked on the optimum cost, optimum budget so that these devices can actually work. But now, since we're trying to develop more tech to this, we'd like to work with partners. So that way, if any lovely soul here can connect us to uh, potential tech people who can build devices on low cost basis and give us some ideas, volunteer their time, and also probably give us the resources to secure this or procure this, that'll be great so that it can be a very holistic collaboration on the long term and that's how we 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 see it and that's the kind of support that we obviously look forward to and and like i said earlier expansion to the other landscape would mean a little more resources in terms of procuring the current devices yeah absolutely um but then again the more you expand the more data points you have and the more you can hone in on the accuracy and and improve the technique overall um Absolutely. that's wonderful I think we have exhausted all of the questions, but I'm getting lots of positive feedback. Everyone is very inspired by what you're doing. I know IEF is extremely proud to support this work. Uh, we value your expertise and your time teaching everyone this approach and your considered and thoughtful way that you have approached a specific region um, for human elephant conflict because as we all know, HEC is not a one size fits all problem. So we love these solutions that are actually getting to the core and making a difference. So thank you so much. Thanks, sir. Thanks again. Thanks to Deborah as well. It was it was a pleasure meeting you both at the Chiang Mai conference. And, and yeah, and hopefully next time when I'm there, I'll be able to present this much more refined. Thank you. That would be wonderful. Uh, we very much look forward to having you at all of our future conferences. We, I know that I enjoyed finally meeting you in person. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Julie for a couple more comments and then we will wrap up. Yes, thank you very much for such a wonderful presentation. Um, I'd like to invite everybody to turn on their cameras and let's give Dr. Krishnan a very warm round of applause for such a great presentation. Thank you so much for joining us. And if you would like to support his work, we've put the link in the chat. So um, we just appreciate um, all of you so much. Thank you so much for joining us. And um, we hope to see you on our next chat, which will be in May on, I don't have the exact date in front of me. Um, let me see here. Sarah, do you have that date by chance? Almost. Oh, oh, May 17th. May 17th are. will be our next chat. So mark your calendars for that. Um, it will begin at 10 a.m. Central and it will feature Northern Rangelands Trust. So that will be our next chat. So thank you again, Dr. Krishnan, for a very wonderful presentation. And thank you to all of you who have joined us for this live session. Yeah. Thanks, 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 everyone. Thanks, Julie. Thanks, everyone. I'd also like to thank the, the folks here who have been patient to, to listen to me, and especially Dilip and Ramesh and, and, and Amrita, who's part, of the, who's part of my team. I'm very fortunate to have them here, and they're the ones who probably go now and sit and monitor these devices in the night, and, and thanks to them for, for being here as well. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.